Hello YouTube, this is Ready Set Exploit, and we're gonna be doing Debbie from TryHack Me, which is a box I created that highlights three different vulnerabilities. We start off with a web server that has a source code available to us, and when we examine the source code, we find that um, it's doing a mathematical operation using eval, which is a very vulnerable uh, Python uh, function that allows us to execute code on the server side. And we use that to get an initial foothold on the box as uh, user number one, uh, which is Bruce. Then we see that we can run a Python script as Gordon, the second user, that does some XOR encryption. Um, so the, we then perform an attack known as the plain text attack that allows us to extract the key. And because Gordon shared with us um, their encrypted password, we use the key to decrypt the password. And then we, once we have access as Gordon with that password, we see that there's a cron job running as root that copies files from one directory of Gordon's to another. And there's a wildcard being used and we can get root a couple different ways. Um, I'm gonna show two different ways that you can get it. Uh, but without further ado, I'll go ahead and get started. So uh, first things first, we want to go ahead and run nmap scan. I already ran nmap scan because this one can take a bit long, uh, not too long, barely within like two two minutes or so. But I don't want to make you wait, so I'm gonna go ahead and have the results ready while I start the scan. sudo nmap dash v dash dash min rate ten thousand. I'm going to the IP address dot ten dot ten dot one two seven dot nine dash p dash grab open. We don't have to do the grab open part. Um, just something I do. And we find two ports, twenty two and five thousand. Right. So you see, even this quick scan takes a little bit long, uh, but it shouldn't find any more ports. So then now. I'm going to do sudo nmap dash b for verbose dash sbc to run to numerate versions and run default scripts dash on to save to file called nmap.txt. The IP address dash p22 and then 5000. This does the nmap scan a little bit quicker. Uh, this still takes um, about two or three minutes to finish on here. So I already ran the results uh, before. And let's go ahead and review them and minimize this. So. Port 22 is open SSH, Ubuntu, uh, not much going on, but at least we do have um, distro information. And port 5000, it doesn't say that it's a HTTP server, but um, off the bat, but if you, it does do a get request and it says HTTP okay, so that's our first queue, it's running WorkSerg, which is a Python framework. Um, it might also be running Flask, uh, but it looks like NMAP just makes this educated guess math formulas so and then this is a different breakdown kind of what we saw so that's why it takes a little bit longer because mf is running the script to try to determine what it is see it's still running and actually it's for educational purposes what i'm going to do is i'm going to do pseudo time let's do that not not work time there we go just to see how long it really takes so Let's go ahead and check out the web server on port 5000. Uh, 5000. And we have this math formulas. Uh, feel free to use any of the calculations below. Quadratic formula. So it gives us a exam couple examples already. Um, tells us the roots. And see if it's a prime number. It's the prime number. And then the bisection method with this formula and root is one. So, you know, just a simple little formula. We could do a go buster or uh, some kind of directory brute force in. And we are given the source code here, which whenever you're given the source code, the, we definitely want to have a look at it because it can tell you a lot more about the application that we don't know. So we do source code, gonna move it. Uh, here, then we're gonna unzip source.zip. And we see math, drive, so we have all the functions. There we go. 
uh, templates we can ignore. That's just the index, which you could just view the source. But we have app and then the different uh, functions. So this is where, um, this is actually a, a quite of a change. When I first created this machine, there was no source code. You kind of just had to, you know, do like a, a, like a blind pen test and try to figure out. And the way to have figured out at the time, I like to cover both, is you could uh, maybe enter a character here, see that it doesn't work. Does have to be a comic, could be any non character. Could do this, for example. We see that it doesn't work. Here, however, let's introduce this one application crashes. So, first clue is like, oh, there's something going on here, right? And um, you, we could have assumed that this was Workswig or Flask and found different, um, different formulas to try. But I understand that. Maybe this could have drove users a little bit uh, upset because we we're almost guessing. Although you do, uh, there that is a form of um, when it comes to like uh, catching bugs on site, trying different things blindly if the source code isn't available to you, and to see if, what can you find. But uh, for the sake of learning, uh, I'm gonna also do it. I'm gonna show you how you could have gotten to this conclusion in a little bit let's go ahead and review the source code and if you're not familiar with source code this was a medium challenge um, you don't have to be an expert on it but i'll show you how you can um, approach this just to see what's going on so we can look at app when it comes to flask app is usually the first the main one and we see it's using flask we see it's using input form 3 math there's a lot of comments which helps. Um, it's very beautiful written code, not really. So this is where all the post happens. And we have, so this is the main function. This is where whenever we click on the form, whenever we click on any form, it goes to here, the post request, and it sends, sends it here. We have bisect, we have compute, and prime f. So let's see, this one's compute right here. So format, so it's from two decimal places and it just does the formula that has flow. So off the bat, nothing here, right? So same thing here with prime, everything's being treated as a number. And if you're looking through this code, um, you'll probably, it's small, but you'll pick this up that this is using eval. And let's assume you don't know what eval is. You notice it's not using it anywhere else. Okay? It's, and then it goes through the numbers, right? So um, eval, if you weren't sure and you picked up that was the original thing, that was the only thing that stands out from the three functions, you could have done something like Python eval exploit. And eval is using a lot of other applications. So it's not unique python and this post for example and there's a lot of other posts the command injection in python exploiting eval functions but this one actually medium article if you scroll down it tells you evals use one plus one to return two and so we have a pretty similar similar scenario and it even gives you a payload to try reverse shell it essentially says this uh, what eval does is it can execute um, just to provide input executed its um, Python code, it would provide, um, it allows us to call other uh, functions like system, and it allows us to spawn a, a actually execute code on the server side. Exact is also a dangerous function. So this is one way, this was one way you could have found it, whether you had the source code or not, you would have just seen, okay, what can I do with a Python app? What can I try? Because clearly something's breaking, right? So, uh, but the source code helps a lot because you would have seen eval. Um, other ways you could have found it, you could have done grep, you could have done eval or exact um, or, I don't know, system. And it would have pointed you to here as well. This would have done a recursive search. Another one is if we look at the bisection method, because this just handles the forms. This one, 
is let's see bisection let's look at prime and the one thing that is different is this actually let's look at prime and let's look at quadratic so float field float field so the two safe ones use float fields and this uses string fields this allows us to put strings as opposed to float uh, this wt forms already checks is this a number and if it does doesn't eval would also just not work so those would have been two big clues that oh let me focus on bisection only and see what's happening what is another great thing is when we have the source code we can let me actually take a snapshot here um, we can actually run um, the application locally which allows us to test do further testing to prove our theory so let's go ahead and do Python we can just run it we don't have this um, so let's see pip install that from let's see pyplays so pypy pip install wt forms right um, we could do this one as well so let's minimize that and there we go and if we run the app now see we can access it locally And let's see. So come back to this, this, come back to that. Focus on our local app. And it's the same app, right? So we're going to use Burp Suite here. And what this will allow us to do is anything we send, we'll see the results right here. And this will make the testing just a lot easier, right? So we focused on this one there it is sent to repeater and we see here so um, another thing with blind injection um, if you didn't use the source code you're probably gonna we're probably gonna have a bit of a hard time and I'll explain how so let's go back here I can turn this off now actually uh, was it hacking Python applications? Something like that. Yeah, there we go. So you could go right for the reverse shell, hope for the best. Um, so let's just, you just copy this. You might not copy it correctly because commas, but you can work with this. So instead of going for it, let's take a step back. What if we do something that'll show? Right. So if you weren't doing the source code, you were going right off the application, you would get an internal server error. And if you see this, you probably think I did something wrong, something in my payload is not working. Why? Right. But if you ran it locally and you took a second look, you see that the execution did happen right there. So you know that it is being executed. So now that you know it does work lo locally, you just have to apply it to the server. Uh, another thing I like to do is let's say now let's actually capture the uh where it go oh it finished it took a hundred a little less than two minutes for the results 109 seconds so let's go ahead and go oops let's go to the sport again don't need this anymore let's capture it with verb let's submit turn it off now and go back here let's say you were doing blindly whenever I'm dealing with command execution if I don't see something show do TCP dump sudo TCP dump I think it's dash I N I C M P uh, I could be wrong um, tune zero I don't think that's right uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. TCP dump. Listen for ICMP. For pinks. Um, see, that's it. Uh, so that's one way. Uh, 
think I remember. I think it was sudo tcp dump. Um, I think it's ni uh, turn zero icmp. Oh, I put tcmp here. I can't. That that's why I messed up. Um, so let's say you're doing this blindly. Let's go back here. So this is locally, and this is um, on our target. So we do the thing, we do this attack, see, get an error. So whenever I'm dealing with this, I like to try things that'll call back to me. You can do curl, we get, but ping is usually the safest most of the time. So unless you're running in, in, into a bare bones Docker container, that may not work. Because uh, sometimes even ping's not installed. Uh, twenty uh, percent twenty is for uh, spaces. They're safer than pluses. Um, just more tedious to type, and burp doesn't always do it. So I'm gonna do ping one because if you don't specify, it will uh, just ping forever and you hang the machine. So let's go ahead and send it, and we get a reply from the target machine. So even though it still gives us an error. It executed. So, uh, two ways to confirm that we have code execution. And now we just have to do a reverse shell. Uh, there's probably a couple of different ways to do it. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna do bash uh, nine thousand and one shell upgrades. I'm going to listen on oh, LVMP 9001. Now, the commas are here, but that's okay. Just going to do this. Um, here, we could just do single quotes. Python doesn't really care here. And then we just have to, I think it'll work. I don't think we have to URL encode. Let's find out. I was wrong. So let's see. Percentage 20. Because the percentage 20 can get a little. You easily get miss it or get lost. Percentage 20. Percentage 20. Percentage 20, then one more. You'll know you got them all when it's all red. Uh, oh. And of course, we have to URL encode these. URL encode the ands. And there's one more. Where are you? Right here. So as long as you did it right. So it's, at this point, it's not even about Python. It's just about encoding properly. And there we go. We have a reverse shell. Um, and it just came down to the encoding, really. So that was one way, two different ways you could have gotten shell t put um, lines t put calls sty raw dash echo semicolon fg to bring the process back sty rows 34 columns 145 export term equals x term and now we can clear our string so i hope that was helpful we can actually cancel this now uh, we don't need this end map. We just call this reverse shell one. So we are Bruce. We have our flag there. Uh, we also notice we have two notes. Now you're probably wondering why was there an eval function? Why didn't the developer move it? And that's kind of the theme of the box. If you look at checklists, have application checklist, build site check, test site check, move site production check remove dangerous functions from site. So first of all, the first thing is this should be before number three, right? And second, clearly Bruce thought that the, he removed the dangerous functions from the site when clearly he forgot one and checked it. And this is the importance of things like code review, um, with not just review your own code, but have someone remove your code. And in this case, that someone could have been Gordon, there's another user on this machine, right? So, and that's one of the vulnerabilities. It's not just a eval function, but just a human error uh, on this on this part. But there was another one. There was a note. 
Hello, Bruce. So uh, password is encoded using the super secure XOR format. And I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, so I made the uh, key quite lengthy. So that means we have a, a long key. Spiced it up with some base64 at the end to make it even more secure. That's interesting because base64 is not really that secure. So uh, I'll share the decoding script for it soon. However, you can use my script located in the app directory. And for now, look at the super secure string. All right. Um, so this secure string is the password because we know this was encoded. And XOR, it can be secure. It is an encryption format, but it has a lot of weaknesses. And I'll go over it soon. And XOR, you can see it in things like um, encoded payloads for command and controls. You know, uh, uh, malicious actors tries to find try to find ways to encode their payload as efficient as possible. Sometimes, um, so you will see XOR, right? Um, so it can't be secure. It's just how it is implemented. And I'll show you the weakness here. So let's look at the op directory. Um, we can't read it. See, only Gordon can read it and root, but no world readable. So if we do op encrypt, can read it. So how, if you can't, with Python, if you can't read it, you can't use it. See? But if, let's see, sudo l. But we can use it as Gordon. And because Gordon can read it, right there, Gordon, um, we can use it. But we just can't read it as Gordon. We don't have that um, capability. We don't need a password. So sudo dash u Gordon. What happens if we use it? enter a password in a script, password, and we get the encryption. So this looks like base64, but if we do echo, type base64 decode, we don't get anything, see? So let's do, we could turn to Cyberchef. Let's see. It's loading, come on. There we go. So happens if we decode this, it just get junk, right? Um, so, let's see. So this is where the weakness starts, and I'll go over into it. Um, don't need that. I'll keep it just in case I lose the shell. You could drop an SSH key, but um, not necessary at the moment or at all really so let's do cyber chef so let's do if you google something like XOR plain text attacked right or let's do XOR weaknesses because the thing with XOR you just need to know the key to figure out the key uh, let's see basic XOR so XOR it is a bitwise right um, it's a bitwise function so let's see XOR plain text attack this actually explains it better so and a known plain text attack I like this diagram here so if the plain text if we have the plain text and well the plain text gets uses the key to become the encrypted text just like the encrypted text and the plain text make up the key or the encrypted text and the key become the plain text. We, this is the decoding part, the encryption part, decryption part. But this part right here is the interesting part. Because, um, let's see, what is XOR? Uh, definition of XOR, let's see if this is a good example. Uh, let's see, so right here, right, XOR logic. Zero, XOR zero is zero. One or XOR one is also zero, but one XOR zero is one and zero XOR one is zero. So these last two is key, are key. So it's kind of like saying, this is some encryption, uh, plain text key encryption. Um, yeah, and so this is the encryption, right? Plain text key encryption. And then this is key, or you could treat it as key and the decryption. I mean, the encrypted is plain text, or here, right here. That, um, so what if we have plain text, encryption, key? And that is pretty much a very simplified way of doing so. See, plain text, secret key. 
So um, that's pretty much a very simplified way of how it works. So how can we use this to ourselves? Well, the weakness doesn't necessarily lie in XOR. The weakness lies in how we were given access to it. We know the plain text in this case, password, and we know what the um, encryption is going to be. The end result, right? It is this. It's just base64, and we know that that happens at the end. Otherwise, it would just show thing with X where it would just show you a bunch of junk. And that would be very tough. We would we have to convert it to something we can read like base64. So that's the first weakness. Because we know both, we can figure out the third, in this case being the key. Second weakness, which I'll get to um, in a little bit. So I'm going to do it two ways. I'm going to use CyberChef. I'm also going to use Python because it's just a good way to show both. So let's see. From base64 and Python does have. And the reason why I want to show both is because CyberChef won't always work. This is kind of a simple, this is a simple um, XOR. There can be complicated XORs. So let's do there. We have junk. Let's treat, and if we treat the original text as the key, we see we get superset. Um, and we can bounce these around. So, for example, let's do password. Let's turn this off. Let's do password here. Let's do here. Let's do base64. Let's get rid of this. We get the same result just like if we get rid of this put it here and do utf see we get junk or if we do two base 64 we get the final result so they they play around as long as you have two of them you can figure out that there are no problem but this is where the third week the second weakness lies we have the end result of Gordon's password. If we didn't have this, even if we can figure out the key which we're about to do, we wouldn't be able to do anything with it. So this is another case of human error um, that this there was no reason for this to be exposed. Gordon was just kind of showing off. And because of that, we can figure it out. Now, we know the key is quite lengthy. And this, why did I close it? Um, plain attack XOR let's see uh, the, if the key is smaller than the plain text the key is repeated and that is it does make it extremely weak right so what does that mean that means that if our we know that the key is quite lengthy how lengthy I mean it can be it could it be a million characters maybe we'll find out but we'll know when the key starts repeating it could be that this is very small so you could do something like uh, password, 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 password. Get a longer tags. And if we go back, um, so let's go ahead. You know, this is just, uh, let's see. This is easier to do it this way. See? There we go. Starts forming. And you see it repeats super secret XOR super secret and there we go so the key is actually super secret key XOR XOR so that's our key uh, let's now apply the same thing using Python so let's see call this decrypting uh, let's call it decrypt key call, I'll call this key so it doesn't have to be complex. M4 base64. We're gonna do um, let's see. So password password equals uh, where is it? Password, password, password. Yeah. And I need to see Python convert from base 64. Uh, where it go? This one. There we go. It's a good one. I always go. You could use ChatGPT, right? If you like. 
Um, that's a good one right here. I'll probably have to fix it. Uh, and this is the base 64. Copy that. And let's see. So there we go. So now, uh, let's see. Our key is equal to actually, how am I doing? This is going to be our key. There we go. Not G, key. And now we do XOR for I in range zero length of the password XOR and on password and bitwise operation uh, key and then I divided by the length of the key you have to close this, that, and that. Yeah, I think that's it. Um, and then when done, print XOR. Should work. And no, oh, not quite. So let's see what I miss. Uh, so let's see. So have the password, password, password. So we have the base 64 string we're decoding it so of the password XOR <laughs> I see try that again ah there we go we got it so that is our first one and you didn't have to do it with Python but it's always good practice XOR examples you could have even done chat GPT at this point uh, you could even do GitHub, right? A lot of examples that follow the same format, right? I don't think that will work, but uh, I think when I created this machine, there was no ChatGPT, so learning it was a good experience. Um, you know, and the reason why I made the key that way is because, assuming we didn't know the, the original text, we only knew the encrypted, brute force in that key would still take a while. Python XOR decryption GitHub. So if we look at this one, this is this is an iter tool. So it just depends on who writes it that it'll work, right? See, so this is the more complicated one. So that's why I wanted to do a simple one so as to not to drive someone like too upset. Um, but anyway, now we can just apply the same and crack that password. Copy key to pass PI. Um, so now, all we have to do is everything's going to change here. We don't need this. We do need that. We need this. Because it, um, let's see, there we go. Let's see, and now this becomes the password, and we know what our key is. And it's here. You could do the whole thing; it really doesn't matter. And I'll show you both. Um, This should work. We got the password. So let's go ahead and do it without it. Um, super secret key XOR XOR. So we don't need you. Got the key here. Uh, this is UTF. And let's go back here. Get the key, I mean, get the encrypted password. We know it's from base 64. Uh, that's wrong. From base 64. 
and we get the same. So whether you use the entire key or the partial key, because it repeats, it'll give us what we need. So let's go ahead and see if, like, you have to confirm, you know, pretty much give it away that it's the password. All right, Gordon, let's see. So clear, why not? Sue, Gordon, password. And let's see, can we do? Uh, we can also SSH as Gordon. Uh, what's the IP address? Had, oops. And that. <laughs> creds. Cat creds. There we go. And there we go. We have access. So we'll call this SSH. SSH Gordon. I like to have bigger tabs because I can X out sometimes. Sudo dash L is a standard. Can run sudo. We're just part of Gordon group. And you set UIDs. And I'm going to show you how to find this manually. Because I always think a manual approach is just good practice for knowing, um, you know, what to look for. Because a lot of times you're looking for the same thing. Set UIDs that stand out. Snap is installed. Do, nope. Nothing is installed. Do we have it? All kernel. We don't. Sort of do, but it's not vulnerable that I know of. Uh, let's see. And let's look at the home. We have our second flag. We have two directories. So that's interesting. First thing to notice. Backups and reports. Uh, these reports are, yeah, from, from a while ago. Actually, no, sorry. A little, almost two months ago. Let's look at what they say. See if they mean anything. Uh, but you didn't think Batman is bruised. Nah, so that's nothing. It's just me being... Like, silly. Uh, I told Bruce that the website... So, just to finish up the story and to explain why the website was vulnerable. It's because, yeah, Gordon told Bruce that the website is still vulnerable, but he didn't listen. So, Gordon knows there's something wrong with the site. Um, and Bruce just didn't care. Bruce is arrogant. So, and finished my Excel script, found no vulnerabilities, share permissions, rules for execution only. So, again, just human error. Uh, Gordon didn't find any vulnerabilities. Uh, I'm, then maybe Bruce wouldn't have found them either. But the importance of code review to make sure and just different and how this is implemented uh, would have completely avoided us getting this far. If we, if Gordon had never shared that password on that note, we would have never made it this far. So, you know, just a couple things to, um, you know, some things to keep in mind. It's not just really about bad code. It's just about how the implementation of it. So anyway, um, so what it's in backups and seem to be the same files um, because they're the same size and we can read them to confirm. The only difference is uh, these are our current time. Let's see. No, a minute apart. So, um, and I could tell you, but my clock on top, right? So at 24, they, they were there at 24 and then got create, modified again, 25. Another thing to keep in mind, Gordon owns these files, right? Uh, Gordon owns them. And then the group of Gordon, oh, sorry. The group of Gordon owns these files and then they got changed to root. I don't know what this is. <laughs> Probably something I did. Um, these look like permissions and I think six for yeah I think I gave them permission that the permissions on the file well that's funny I missed that that's hilarious um, but root owns them so we know there's probably some kind of cron job 26 25 24 so either some kind of system D or cron job that is copying those files 
and over. And we that's a fair assumption without even using something like PSPY. Do we have access to any kind of file? Gordon, type F, dev, null. And I always like to ignore grab, I mean, grab process and sys. We don't, sys can be useful, but a lot of times I do like to ignore it. Because otherwise we get a lot of output. Um, nothing there. Group. Gordon. We knew this. So Gordon, we knew that. And this one stands out. Backup. What's that? Is that a binary? Uh, born again shell. It's just a bash script. So um, security through obscurity is not great because maybe you make it think it's a binary. Can I even read it or reverse it? No. It is a um, it's the bash script and if you look at the permissions yeah only gordon can read it only root can write it and then it's a simple script it goes into the reports directory and while it's in there it copies everything onto the backups and this is the tricky part i wouldn't say this is a vulnerability um maybe there's ways to control it but i mean wild cards as you know tend to have a particular Okay, we don't need this anymore. We have a password. And if we do wildcard injection bash. Many articles on using things like tar. Tar is a big one, right? With other things. Uh, or when you can go back, directories. Um, but copy doesn't really have wildcard. Um, but if we look at copy man, copy man page. And this is where experiment comes into play. There's two ways to um, there's two ways to achieve. There's probably more. I believe there's maybe other ways, but the way I like is by using this preserve mode. Right, and I'll show you an example how that works. So this preserves the mode. The default is mode ownership timestamp, and you or you can select which one. Mode is like permissions, ownership is, you know, who owns the files, and timestamp, if you want to keep the original timestamp. Because as you notice, um, when it gets copied to backups, uh, it's not good. It changes everything, the time, uh, the time, and the ownership. And I think that it's probably the same. Yeah, see, if it wasn't the same, and I think maybe that's what I try to do. Anyway, um, but what if, so for example, let's do experiment. Um, CD experiment. Let's create a file called test. Um, see, we own test right so let's do let's set the set uid to test as the rsc user right what happens if i copy test to test 2 uh let's see everything goes back to read write the default read write so six four four right and for now ownership change everything changed time change move test two and let's remove but now what if what if I wanted to keep this keep this does this matter to me but keep no I wanted to change this change uh, change this doesn't matter I wanted to keep this this is where this comes into play. If you look at something like preserve ownership bash files, um, this is a legitimate use. If you read through this little article, it mentions that dash p because I think dash p does the same thing, same as preserve mode. But um, dash p does all of them. We just want to keep mode. So this is a legitimate use. Um, 
you know, of this file. So it's not really a vulnerability. It's just, again, how it's implemented. So let's try it again. So let's do sudo copy test dash dash preserve uh, equals mode test two. We kept the sweet bit, but root now owns the file, right? So if you're, you know, that is um, one way to do this. So what is a sweet bit we would like that's an easy route? Bash. So that's one way to do it. Um, I'm not sure the second way in a bit. So let's see. We're going to do, let's go to reports. So let's do copy user bin bash to here. And when that's successful, we're going to set the sweet bit. Now we can set it because the moment we copy it from here, because this is owned by root, but when we copy it, as we know, it'll change to us. So we can set the sweet bit to us. But then, um, but then we have to set, how do we set the permission? Well, similar to tar injection, if you look at like wildcard tar injection, because um, this is the tricky part I think a lot of people may have found is you can create empty files so see like this echo and then happens is you create the parameter right uh, the parameter as a file so bash allows you to do that and when it reads it when it'll when it copies everything so when it gets to reports it'll copy copy bash file one or I guess report one report two report three dash dash for a serve equals mode and it'll do that for everything so we do echo press serve equals mode and now we just have to wait. We're on 33. We just have to wait for 34. And um, then I'm going to, well, we wait. It's going to talk about the other way, um, via, which is via symlinks. And there's a couple different ways to do it. I'm going to show you a very simple way. Um, let's see. First, I'm going to, actually, no, I don't even have to do that. What I am going to do is, oh, a minute already passed. And if we look at backups, it didn't work. Uh, I missed something. Let's see. Bash hmat you plus. Did I set the sweet bit here? I did. Oh, I see what I did. Let's remove that. Typos, you know. Do that again. There you go. So I'm actually going to. So. Same links, pretty simple. You can link a file to another place. Um, there is a use for it. Sometimes you want to edit a file. You have enough permissions and it'll edit the original one. Um, so that's kind of what this vulnerability lies. And the reason why I'm copying it is just because it's easier to edit. So I'm going to go to the top, go to the top, yank back to the bottom, here, paste. Call it RSC. Remove the X. That'll give me an easy password. Copy past WD. And this is what we're gonna do. So this, let's see, the minute has definitely passed. Let's see, we're gonna go back up. There it is. And you see, it didn't copy the dash dash, but that's okay owned by root backups bash dash p who am i root user oh that's not right and we can go to the root directory and we get our final flag so that's one way to do it right next way is 
we can do a symlink of Etsy past WD to home backup of oh, home Gordon backups past WD. So essentially what this means is if any edits that happen here, right? Instead of having to go to that file every time, maybe we could just edit this and then this will edit this and that includes permissions. So you see where I'm going? So let's create the symbling, but um, don't be fooled. We can't, uh, let's see, backups. We still can't edit this one because the same link to that one, right? Even though the permissions say so. Backups, past WD. So let's see, warning, change, changing a read file only. Even though we own it, it own the directory and says we own it, this is not how this L, this is not how it works because we're still taking this. So this will only be useful if you own both files. But we, what if we take advantage of, uh, so we do bi past WD here. Copy everything. So now because, because root is executing this, um, and I'll go into that in a second, root, uh, even though we created this file, it will overwrite this file. Why? Because root owns this file and root can edit this file, thus editing this file. And we just have to wait a minute unless it already happened, let's find out. It did, there it is. So the original file is there. So su rse, we are root again, and there it is. So those are two different ways, uh, both pretty clean, you know, because then once you have root, you could change the passwords of root or something and then just Remove this user if you don't want to be caught. The bash, once you get bash and establish persistence, you can do the same thing with, um, and just remove that file. So those are two very fun ways. And if we look at the script, um, again, a simple fix for this would have been to just, even if you found other ways to copy it, why did root have to run this, right? If Gordon, Gordon owned both directories. So um, a misconfiguration, human error, um, that would have stopped this in its track. So anyway, that's the machine. Um, had a lot of fun making it, and I hope it taught you uh, different, different ideas, technology, and how to approach different problems. Um, I wanted to create a nice theme of misconfiguration and you know, it's not the best coding practices uh, with eval, even in some wildcard injection, or uh, coding up your own X or decryption, right? Which we you can even see here. It's a simple script. Uh, one thing I did is I just do the accept. So if you're familiar with a lot of programming languages with um, error catching, error handling, accept. Um, if you do accept by itself, it just won't give you any error. And I was trying to eliminate you trying. Uh, any, a user crashing the application when entering the password, so that they could expose the key. That would have been an, that would have been an interesting weakness, I think. But it, then we wouldn't there wouldn't be the lesson of the plain text attack. Anyway, feel free to comment, like, and subscribe, and I'll see you all next time.